The next topic is the SI units. These are internationally accepted form of the metric system. It defines seven base units. In chemistry, the most frequently used base units are the length with the base unit of meter, the mass with base unit of kilogram, the time with base unit of second, the thermodynamic temperature with base unit Kelvin, the amount of substance with base unit mole. The electric current is mostly used in physics and the luminous intensity is rarely used. We can also multiply or divide these base units to get derived units. For example, if we want to get the unit of area, we multiply the base unit of length two times. And meter times meters is meter square. For volume, we multiply the length unit three times to get meter cubed. We can also get the units of density, which is defined as mass divided by volume. And this would be the base unit of, of mass, which is a kilogram, divided by the unit of volume, which is meter cubed. Then we can also get smaller or bigger quantities than the base unit by including prefixes in the names and factors in the numbers. For example, we can have one meter written as one meter. And if we want to represent 10 meters, we can write this with a factor of 10 meters, like this. If we want to have a thousand meters, we can write this as one times 10 to the third, because 10 to the third is a thousand meters. Now, this one here, if we look at the prefix for 10, this can also be written as one decameter or one dam. This one can be written as one kilometer, which is the one here, or one km. To get smaller quantities, for example, of 0 0.001 meter, this is 1 times 10 to the negative 3 meters, which is 1 millimeter. Or 1 mm. If we want to get something like 0 0.0000. 0, 1, that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. And this is 1 micrometer. Or 1 mu m. Let's do some problems about unit conversion. The first one says a square has side lengths of three inches. What is a square's perimeter in centimeters? So the side length of the square is 3.0 inches. This has two significant figures. To do a unit conversion, we need to do units required is equal to units given times a conversion factor which is written as a fraction. In this case, we need to find the perimeter, which is four times the length of the square. So we write four times, and the length is three inches, 3.0 inches, and we need to convert it to centimeters. So we need to put a conversion factor. We know that for every one inch, there is 2.54 centimeters and we put the same units in opposite top and bottom so that they eliminate. And we're left with units on the top of centimeter. Then we need to multiply all the numbers 
and divide them accordingly. So after multiplying all of these, we get 30.48 centimeters. Now, we need to have two significant figures because our measure value is 3.0, which has two sig figs. So this needs to be rounded to 30 point centimeters, which has two significant figures. That's our answer. The next part of the question says, what is the area in square meters? The area is the length square. So we need to convert it first uh, the in from inches to centimeters and to centimeters to meters and then take the square okay to do the conversion of the length we know that we have three inches and the conversion factor to centimeters is 2.54 centimeters for every one inch and then we know that for every 100 centimeters, we have one meter. And again, the same units in opposite directions for centimeters and inches. So inches go away with inches, centimeters go away with centimeters. And we're left with units of meters on the top. After multiplying all of these, we get 0 0.0762 meters. Don't get the significant units yet. Do it at the very end. So after that, we need to square this to get the area. So after doing this, we get 0 0.0058 meters squared. And this has two numbers that are significant. So this can also be written in scientific notation as 5.8 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared, having two significant figures as desired. Moving on to the second problem. It says to convert a density of 11,700 kilogram per cubic meter into gram per centimeter cubed. Okay, so we want a density in gram Per centimeter cubed and we start with 11,700 point kilogram per meter cubed. First we convert the kilogram for every one kilogram we have 1,000 grams and next we convert the meter for every one meter we have a hundred centimeters. But notice that we have only meter on the top and meter cubed on the bottom, so we need to cube the conversion factor. Now, having done that, we rewrite everything and here we have 1 meter cubed divided by 10 to the 6 a centimeter cube. Remember that the cube affects both the units as well as the numbers. So multiplying all of these and dividing everything accordingly, we get 11.700 gram per centimeter cube. Notice that kilograms go away with kilograms, meter cube goes away with meter cube, and we're left with gram and centimeter cube. Okay, and we need to have five significant figures because the original number had five significant figures. The next topic is systematic versus random errors. Systematic errors are present in every one of a series of repeated measurements. They are always the same sign and magnitude. They are constant, hence the name systematic. They can be caused by flaws in the experiment design or apparatus. Some of the examples include heat lost in a calorimetry measurement because you use the same cup every time and the cup is not a perfect insulator so you will have some heat loss in every one of your measurements. 
A second example could be losing a gas due to a leak. The leak hole is the same in every one of your measurements if you use the same apparatus. So the heat out will be the same flow every time. Another example is forgetting to zero your balance. And let's see an example to show you why. So we have that water is one gram per centimeter cube in density. And we measure uh, the masses of one milliliter of water, two milliliters of water, three, and four milliliters of water. Okay, and then we're trying to prove that the mass and volume have a one-to-one -one relationship. So we know the density is mass over volume. And if we multiply volume on both sides, then we get that volume and mass are equal to each other. So they must have a one-to-one -one ratio. This is the same as saying that we have a y equals x equation, where y is your mass and x is your volume. So we can label our axis volume for x in milliliters and mass in grams for the, the y-axis. So in measuring this, the first one, we forget to zero the balance, so we're taking into account the mass of the beaker. Let's say that the mass of the beaker is one gram. So we actually get one gram from the water plus one gram from the beaker. A total of two grams. For the second measurement, we get two grams from the water and one gram from the beaker. So we get three grams. For the third one, we get three grams from the water plus one gram from the beaker. Four grams. And from the last one, we get four grams from the water and one gram from the beaker. So we plot this, for one milliliter, we get two grams. For two milliliters, we get three grams. For three milliliters, we get four grams. And for four milliliters, we get five grams. This gives us a straight line, but we see that it shifted by one from the theoretical line. So this error is constant in all our measurements, one gram. So it is a systematic error because it's constant and present in all our measurements. Lastly, let me mention that systematic errors cannot be removed by averaging out your measurements. To remove them, you must be able to identify them, know their magnitude and direction, and then subtract it from your measurements. Sometimes this can be hard to identify, but it's the only way to get rid of these errors. Next, we have random error. This type of error can vary both in sign and magnitude, and can be averaged to zero if you take several measurements and average them out. It is caused by unpredictable conditions of the environment or the apparatus. For example, a change in temperature in the environment is a random error. You come to the lab in a hot day and you take a measurement. You come the next day and it's a cold day and you take another measurement. If whatever you're measuring is temperature sensitive, you will get two different results. So it's something that you cannot control. Another example is Misinterpreting the reading of a measurement. You go to the lab with your glasses and read 50 milliliters, and the next day you come to the lab without your glasses and you read 45 milliliters. That's something that you cannot control. It's random. Let me give you another example in the problem here. In this case, you have the same situation as the previous problem, but this time you forget to close the door of the balance in a windy day. 
So we're trying to prove a one-to-one -one ratio of mass and volume, and we know that the density is one gram per centimeter cubed, so we can label these axes accordingly, and we're trying to measure one, two, three, and four milliliters of water. So let's say for the first one, we get a mass of one gram from the water and then an extra 0.1 gram from the wind blowing. So our actual reading is 1.1 gram. For the second one, we get two grams from the water and let's say negative 0.3 grams from the reading. So our actual reading is, actually, is less this time. So the third one would be three grams from the water and let's say 0.2 grams from the wind. So 3.2 grams. And the last one, 4 grams from the water. And let's say this time the wind blows the other way. So we get 3.7 grams for the actual reading. So when we plot this, for the first volume, 1 milliliter, we get 1.1. For the second one, we get 1.7, a little below than the actual value. For the third one, we get 3.2. For the fourth one, we get 3.7. So when we do a best fit line of these data points, we get something very, very close to the actual value. So this is not so bad. But to get rid of this um, error, we can take three measurements for each one of the volumes and average them out. This would give us something very close to the actual value. So, to answer the question, this is a random error because the wind blows in a random matter, blows randomly. in every measurement. Let's look at the difference between precision and accuracy. Precision depends on how close repeated measurements are to one another. Accuracy is the closest of your measurement's average value to the true value. So to measure accuracy, you need to know what your target value is and then see how close your measurements are to that target value. Let me give you an example to explain the difference between precision and accuracy. So you have a bullseye target, and the goal of this is to shoot your darts at the very center of the bullseye. So the bullseye target is the center of the circle, of the red circle. Okay, so let's look at the first case. Here, all of the darts are close to one another, and they are at the center of the red circle. Are they precise? Yes, because they are close to one another. Are they accurate? Yes, because they are at the target. For case B, we see that all of the darts are close to one another, so yes, they are precise. But they are far from the center of the red circle, so they are not accurate. For the third case, we have that all of these darts are spread out from one another, so they are not precise. But they are close to the center of the circle, and if you take their average value, they are pretty close, so they are accurate. In the fourth case, all of the darts are away from one another, so they are not precise, and they are also away from the center of the circle, so they are not accurate. 